Hey everyone. So today I want to talk about something that's at the core of our humanity. Partying. <laughs> Have you ever been to a party where you felt completely alive, connected, and utterly joyful? That feeling of being swept up in the moment, surrounded by laughter and good vibes. It's pure magic. But what if I told you that you didn't have to wait for some special occasion to experience that magic? What if you could take the essence of that party and bring it into your daily life? Humans have been partying for a long time. And scientists have uncovered squash and gourd remnants that were used as dishware for parties that took place over 4,000 years ago. And while the ways in which we party have obviously evolved, and vary with age and culture. The essence of community and sharing enjoyable experiences remains constant. According to Dr. Gazaniga, a psychologist at the University of California, partying is unique to humans. No other species can conceive of such a notion, never mind even plan a party. So humans are literally party animals. And this might be because partying was actually essential to the survival of early humans. As we started to live in groups of more and more people, our brains became taxed trying to figure out ways to establish connections with everyone. So we adapted and developed pro-social behaviors. These behaviors included shared activities, such as laughing, singing, eating, and dancing together, essentially what we consider a party. French sociologist Emile Durkheim coined the term collective effervescence, which is the energy and harmony that arise when we share these enjoyable experiences together. So at this point, some of you may be wondering, who is this guy in a wheelchair, and why does he care so much about partying? So let's start from the beginning. The year is 2003, and like most two-year-olds do, I'm having an epic dance party with my dad. He blasted techno on the boombox, and I showcased my latest moves. If TikTok were around back then, I'd probably be racking up millions of views. Everything was going great until I fell and hit my face on a ledge. This memory is etched into a faint scar that remains above my left eye. But after a quick trip to the hospital to address the wound, the incident was pretty much forgotten. After all, a minor injury is pretty typical for a hyper toddler. But little did we know that those harsh fluorescent hallways of hospitals would become a defining motif in my life. I began to fall more often, and while other kids my age ran and jumped, I quickly became fatigued. At first, my parents attributed this to some poor nutrition because I was an extremely picky eater and my mom often had to chase me around the house to get me to have a bite of my dinner. But genetic testing revealed the culprit for my weakness. I had Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD, a genetic muscle wasting disorder that affects one in 4,000 boys. With no prospects for any treatment at the time, the doctors told my parents I'd continuously lose muscle function and probably only live into my early 20s. My parents were shocked and devastated. They were expecting their son to have a minor treatable illness, not a lifelong progressive and terminal disease. At first, I didn't quite grasp things. At that age, I was just too young to comprehend the harsh realities, so my parents shielded me from them. I understood that there was something wrong with my muscles, but I just assumed the weakness was temporary. One day at recess, however, a classmate approached me and told me his parents told him that I'd be in a wheelchair pretty soon. And another time during summer camp, my camp counselor said I'd only probably live until I was 20. I didn't believe them. Things would be different for me, I thought. But as I got older, joyful activities like dancing started to become extremely difficult. And I started to have trouble lifting my arms even above my head. And eventually, I couldn't stand. As I got older and matured, my parents explained everything to me in detail. My world grew smaller. 
and a strangling pressure began to take hold. I realized then that everything would always be harder for me. A bad dream that I just couldn't escape. But the family dance parties continued and I focused on moving my body to the beat despite my new wheelchair. I felt present and connected in those moments, just letting loose and embracing the chaos of the dance parties. I even went to all the parties at my middle school where I danced with a bunch of other sweaty kids to the cha-cha slide. But then high school started and life got much more challenging. In my mind, I didn't fit the standard definition of cool due to all my physical differences. And while my peers were going out and having all kinds of wild new experiences, I was stuck with physical therapy and doctor's appointments. All the parties happened at people's houses and I was rarely invited. Not that it mattered though because none of their houses were wheelchair accessible. I started to get angry and question why the universe was allowing my peers to experience their first relationships, get driver's licenses, and gain complete independence. While I, on the other hand, was losing my independence, developing deep-rooted anxiety, and dealing with all these lifelong medical commitments. But this, this isn't some sad sob story. This is where things get interesting. So one night, I begged my parents to leave the house so I could throw just a small party with a few friends. Things quickly escalated into a wild house party with almost my entire high school class. We just heard about Tom Cruise earlier. I felt like Tom Cruise in the Risky Business movie. <laughs> Things were out of control. Beer spilled all over our grand piano. People I'd never seen before and were just walking around my house and Somehow someone caused the toilet to explode. <laughs> Amid all the insanity and chaos, I just embraced the fun. I forgot about all my struggles. I found myself moving to the music, chatting with the sea of people around me, and feeling present and connected, engulfed with the feelings of the collective effervescence. Everyone was just being themselves and having a blast. I was no longer worried about what people thought of me, and I felt free. Suddenly, though, a neighbor burst in and threatened to file a noise complaint with the cops. The party came to a brisk and untimely end. But I remembered something. In that moment, on that fateful night, I forgot about my struggles and embraced the fun. So I learned the value of incorporating more parties into my life. And I didn't let anything stop me from pulsating with crowds to dance music, whether that meant having to get my wheelchair lifted into fraternity houses or having my friends push past a sea of people so I could navigate my wheelchair to the front of a nightclub. It's always funny when people stare at me, shocked, the seriously disabled dude in the middle of the dance floor spinning around and going crazy. And I realized that everybody likes to party in some way or another, even if it's not the hedonistic club style parties I like to attend. <laughs> Partying is fundamental to enjoying the human experience. But why does it have to be something we plan for, a day we mark in our calendars and wait for? With all the uncertainty and adversity in my life, I never wanted to be waiting around for the fun. So I decided to come up with ways to take the essence of partying and bring it into my daily, everyday life. Step one, energizers. A lot of us at parties have to turn to all kinds of substances to drop our inhibitions and feel temporary highs. But if this was something I was gonna do on a daily basis, I already had enough health challenges going on, so I needed to look for something healthy and practical. So I turned to meditation and breath work. I was definitely a bit skeptical at first, but decided to give it my all and started taking classes and practicing daily. I got to travel to India, Germany, and the mountains of North Carolina, all to learn new techniques. I even became a guided meditation teacher along the way. I found that it's helped me tap into an inner source of energy I didn't know I had. 
started to develop, to develop much more confidence. And some of you are probably rolling your eyes because you've heard about the benefits of meditating a million times and you concluded it either doesn't work for you or it's one of those boring things you're supposed to do but never end up actually doing. But I could also list all kinds of statistics and scientific studies that prove the benefit of meditating. The best way to feel its power, though, is to just start doing it and noticing its impact on your mental and physical well-being. Simple practices like following a guided meditation on YouTube or just focusing on your breath for 15 to 20 minutes are enough. The key is sticking to it no matter what, making it an essential daily habit. It might take a few weeks or even months before you start to see the benefits, so please stick with it and don't give up too soon. Like I said, it's helped me tap into this inner source of energy and all the problems that my mind fixated on and held me back from being who I wanted to be started to feel small and inconsequential in the grand scheme of life. So I realized that essentially I could rely on this new tool and I didn't need substances to be able to just go up to people and start conversations or embrace all kinds of wild new experiences. Step two, connecting. We all like to party because of that satisfying feeling of connection that it brings us. But on a daily basis, it can be hard to socialize. In my situation, oftentimes venues aren't accessible, so I just have to miss out on certain opportunities. And additionally, like many of us have probably felt at some point in our lives, sometimes socializing just didn't cut it. I felt that some of the problems and challenges that I dealt with in my life were so different from that of others that even after talking to my friends about them, I felt isolated and alienated dealing with them. So I decided to search for ways to feel connection that wasn't dependent on the presence of others. And I learned that we feel connected when our body releases neurotransmitters and hormones like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins. And these are all just a bunch of chemicals that can be released in situations that are not dependent on others, such as when we immerse ourselves in nature, engage in deep self-reflection, or enter a flow state. So I decided to start going out more and took my wheelchair on accessible trails, feeling the fresh air and sunshine. And during these walks, I noticed the power of solitude. By asking myself questions and listening to my inner voice, I could learn a lot more about who it is that, what it is that I value and who I am. This self-connection is just as important as connecting with others. And even mundane activities gave me opportunities to feel that connection because by immersing myself in them fully, I could enter a flow state. Whatever it is that you do, pour yourself into it 100% and you will feel that sense of connection. Step three, music and dance. Most parties, even those thrown by our ancient ancestors, involve music and dancing of some sort. Think of the thousands of people that sway together at modern day music festivals, or the ancient Greeks who danced across hot coals during their parties. According to Emma Cohen, an anthropologist at Oxford who studies music and movement, dancing, especially in the presence of others, releases endocannabinoids and boosts our mood. I've always had a big interest in music and dance and I've had a love for techno and electronic music from a young age. I even loved to play instruments like piano and guitar, but as I got older and my muscles weakened, I thought I'd lost these joys forever. But then I discovered the power of digital audio workstations. Using my laptop with some software, I could compose tracks and share them with others online. I even figured out ways to DJ from my wheelchair, using adaptive controllers that work despite my extremely limited arm mobility. So, music and dance are powerful forms of expression. So throw on your favorite track when you get ready in the morning, or have a mini dance party in your living room tonight. I don't care how bad your dance moves may be. 
So these are some of the ways in which I've been able to take what I like so much about parties and bring them into my daily life. And I encourage you to find ways that work for you as well. By embracing this mindset, whether through meditative breath work to boost my mood, connecting deeply with myself in nature, or expressing myself through music and dance, I've seen firsthand how our thoughts and attitudes can shape our physical and emotional worlds. This practice of taking daily moments and turning them into celebrations has not only enhanced my life, but has allowed me to spread the joy to those around me. And this isn't just about ignoring life's difficulties. No, it's just about adding some fun and vibrant experiences to each day. Believe me, sometimes life just sucks. And it can be hard to want to turn each day into a party. But what's a good party without some calamity and chaos? When I think back to that two-year-old version of myself, just dancing happily and not concerned about all of life's challenges, I realized that this natural ability to party was once inbuilt into all of us. It's just a matter of finding it again. Throughout history, various great thinkers and philosophers have presented us with all kinds of frameworks to view life. Stoicism, determinism, cynicism, to name a few, and each offer unique insights into the interplay between our internal states and external circumstances. Today, I introduce partyism, a philosophy where daily life is the party. Thank you.